Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. So um, welcome to uh, Ruby Tuesday and JavaScript Benign number eight. So um, probably brought to you by the Ruby KL Brigade and also the JavaScript Malaysia group. And we have the meetup links here and also slacks if you want to invite yourself in. Um, this is the Wi-Fi password for the venue. Um, if you want to get access to Wi-Fi, you can get this. Okay. Everyone's good. Need some time. So it's at cat guess. Okay. So our venue sponsors um, ACAT, so they've been hosting us for um, quite some meetups since last year. And our new sponsor, um, PBS X3. So this company sponsored all the pizza that we have today. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, they want to promote um, community um, that um, work on JavaScript. So more um, support from the JavaScript community. And uh, introduce yourself. So um, I'm Gui. Uh, I'm the organizer of Ruby and JavaScript Meetup in Penang. Um, and we want to go one round of introduction so that one's good. Okay, start from here. Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm looking forward. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Arthur. Sometimes it's hard to pronounce. So uh, here uh, I work in a small company, and then you saw this also another guy. Mm -hmm. If you can visit this um, but so I'm trying to use a family IT everyone here in the net. Said that quite small amount of events, but I hope that the amount of events will grow in the future. Yeah, so I'm like mostly a Python uh, guy, but not exploring front end, but also, uh, yeah, like JavaScript. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. And uh, my name is Sujay. I also run the Docker Panel Data Group, as you all know. Some of, I've seen some places that you get. Um, I work for a company called Devo, and I do most of the So um, let us start with talks. So these are the talks that we'll be going through. Um, solid programming principle with Ruby and Fossil Tech community. So we'll start with Kyle. So basically only two. Yeah, only two. How much time should I? Um, forty-five or half an hour is okay. Yeah. So HDMI. 
or uh, display? This one. Display board. Yeah, I have. Sorry, I almost never. Okay. Yeah, I had trouble with the. Um, I've never gotten it to work actually. Okay, so for those of you who are interested in the JavaScript part, I promise that this, is, I think, should be applicable to you as well. So it's fairly broad in scope. Uh, I tried to get kind of a Ruby twist on everything, but I think everyone, I, I would hope, would, would um, be interested in some part of the discussion. So what I want to talk about is solid programming principles, and what is that all about? Um, before talking about each, you know, the definition of each of the five principles, I want to talk about what are they overall. And really, it's all about dependency management in um, object-oriented languages. So the claim is that what it can help us to do is make software that's more changeable, more um, you know, resistant to change, um, something that's more manageable overall. And I know the first thing you're probably thinking is, who among us is the most solid programmer? I think that's probably what you're most likely uh, wondering about. So um, I think that uh, competition is in order, and so um, teams would be needed for that. So maybe the front half of the room would be versus the back half of the room. Or finding out who among us is really the most solid program. Um, so what, uh, what, do I, what can we gain out of talking about um, solid programming principles? Why should we even worry about something like this um, rather than just building the software um, as we're already doing it. Um, I think there are three things we can get out of talking about this. One of them is um, better reviewability of code. Uh, so if we, um, as we're reviewing code, if folks are kind of aligned and folks in our teams are aligned around a common set of principles, uh, we can focus our time and energy on basically giving better reviews and, and designing in a better way. Um, we can build more maintainable code. Um, you know, as, as teams grow, they tend to become more distributed, as some of us have been talking about already, that we're working with folks maybe um, not in our immediate area. So if we kind of adhere to a, a common set of principles, then it can make stuff much more, easy, much more easily maintained. And finally, we're always hoping to uh, build code that's um, less coupled together, and, and this, uh, I think these principles can help us to do that. So. Um, just quickly, um, what I want to cover in this presentation is uh, three things. Um, I want to kind of talk about the, the basics of uh, what is solid all about. And once we've talked about the basics, check in to see whether we all agree with um, solid uh, as a matter of principle. And finally, go beyond just the um, basic definition and talk about how can we really apply this in practice in a Ruby code base, in a JavaScript code base. Um, how can we um, make this a reality? Okay, thank you. So why me? Why should I be talking about this? Am I a solid expert? Um, actually, I'm not an expert in anything. Um, I just, uh, I'm just someone who has struggled with putting these ideas into practice. So um, all I want to do is just facilitate kind of five quick discussions or conversations about this topic. So what you can do to help that is to speak up, um, especially you know if you're a JavaScript person, um, tell me what I maybe missed in my Ruby interpretation of these principles, and um, tell me your own ideas about Solid as we go along. So I think the first thing, so before we kind of um, continue on, I want to talk about the thing that's probably all in our minds. And that is, do these guys age, or do they get older over time? Uh, so first of all, does everyone at least know who they are? Does anyone not know who are they? Okay. <laughs> 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 
You don't know who are they? Oh, I'm sorry for you. Um, <laughs> this is He-Man and Skeletor, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so did, my question would be, do they, did they start off as kids and they grow older? Right? Have you ever seen them grow a day older, is my question. Um, so I have not, and I acknowledge that Skeletor is kind of like a special case, like beyond the, the, the situation of aging, but I think my point is that they're kind of eternal and timeless. So what that means is that they started off in kind of the ice age, and they were walking around on the ice, then when global warming has been happening, they're in water, and then um, someday they'll be in boiling water. So that takes us to our two teams. Um, the back of the room, the front kind of room. So who is a very solid um, programmer in the front half team? Who would identify yourself as a very solid programmer? GUI, right? And who's your friend in the back half of the room that's a very solid program? <laughs> cool. Okay, so like I said, there, um, there's this global warming happening, and um, you, you have a single responsibility or a single reason for change, and that is to protect your person from the boiling water. Maybe here. So when I say the boiling water, what I'm actually talking about is, here's the boiling water. So your responsibility is to give the, so take the tools that I've given you and build something that's capable of keeping them out of the boiling water. That's your single responsibility, your single reason for saying, here's your tool for doing that. So you have 30 seconds to build something that does the best job of keeping them out of, uh, so you have to engineer something to keep them out of the boiling water. And your time is starting now. Okay, 10 more seconds for you. Construct something that's sustainable when it's a single responsibility or when it's multiple responsibilities. I guess which team had the easier job to do? Anybody? 
focus on one stuff. Focus on one stuff, yeah. The obvious thing is focus on one thing is easier to do, so it's the single responsibility. Like a class should have one thing that it's responsible for doing, one reason for change. So I have a confession to make about that. When I first look at this employee class, I think that it looks pretty good to me. Um, by the way, um, sorry about the Java or C sharp code because most of the really good examples are in languages like this and we'll talk about that later. Uh, so I think it looks pretty good to me at first in terms of single responsibility. Like these are all things about an employee. You'd have to save the employee to a database. You'd have to know about the person's pay and reporting hours. So what's actually wrong with this? Why is it a failure of single responsibility? Um, anyone have some idea? No question. No constructor, but uh, so you're right. But why, um, like, why is this doing more than one thing? And my idea about that is um, probably if you think about who in an organization would be requesting changes to the class, it's probably different, multiple different people throughout the organization. For example, the calculate pay probably it's finance department that's going to be saying change this method, and the CTO is probably going to be talking to you about changing how it's persisted to the database. So if the CTO, for example, requests changes to the save method, the CFO is not going to be happy if it impacts in some way the calculate pay method. So this is why it's a concern if there are um, kind of multiple people who might be requesting changes. And you know, God forbid that it would be um, multiple people requesting changes at the same time. That would be the worst thing. Um, so, what about in Ruby? Um, what in particular makes this challenging in Ruby? Um, my question would be, why is it in a, particularly in a Rails code base, that we often see kind of like a manager class um, that's doing multiple different things? Um, my kind of own pop psychology theory about this is that it's, um, Rails is a framework that's really good at MVC, that's handling a network request for doing a CRUD action on one resource. Um, but when you have something like making a payment, then probably you're updating a user and or an account and making a record of the payment and sending an email and working with a payment gateway or something. So then in these kind of cases, it's really tempting to make kind of a manager or service class that does multiple different things. So is this kind of thing problematic in Ruby or in JavaScript at all? What do people think? Um, like in, in my view, it really goes back to um, single responsibility is like a people problem. Um, to answer this question of is a manager class bad, I would think about um, are there multiple different clients who are going to be requesting changes to something or different parts of an organization or different customers? And if so, then I think there's maybe an opportunity to split up a class to make it more single responsibility. So the next principle is open close principle. And it basically says I should be able to reuse code, um, the same piece of code for multiple things without having to change that code. Um, so open for extension, uh, but closed for modification. So uh, sorry if it's a little small for you, but it's, it's pretty basic. Um, the, the class on the left does a good job of calculating and adding up the area of rectangles. And uh, mind you, it does that by knowing about how to calculate the area of the rectangle. Uh, but suppose I want to do it with different shapes. I want to use this class for different shapes. Maybe not so useful. Um, I would have to modify the class itself. So the one on the right um, says that uh, shapes should know their own area. And then I, as a class, can add up their, um, their areas without having to know about um, the, the formula for uh, identifying the area of, of each uh, shape. And this, the one on the right, is open for um, extension or use by any kind of shape. So I'd rather have the one on the right. Um, but I, I perceive that particularly with, with Rails, that there's um, this mentality that it's OK if I change things all the time, um, or maybe not so bad. Because of all these reasons, um, Rails is maybe perceived as something that's really good at 
uh, spinning up an MVP or so, of something or uh, quickly prototyping something, and then it's going to change, and Rails is easy for changing the code base anyways. Um, so what do people think about changing things quickly for an MVP of, of, of uh, an app in Rails? Like, is it OK, a good thing, or a bad thing? Yeah, and that's one of, one of the things that um, I read about with Ruby in this principle quite a bit is that if everything's quite well tested, then it's, it's fine anyways. And so I agree with that. Uh, and at the same time, I would argue that I would always rather have the one on the right than the one on the left. So I think that the ease of changing things is not an excuse for forgetting the open close principle in any um, kind of code base. But then you might ask me, so does everything have to be open for um, extension? Like, do we have to use this principle with every piece of code? And of course not. Um, I think this is uh, one of these things where if you think about your developing um, a bit of code, you likely have some idea from your customer, your client, your, your project owner, your project manager, of what are the most likely axes of change in the future. Um, what do we think might change? And those parts of the code base are the parts of, that I would particularly emphasize this principle. Um, anything from JavaScript perspective that I might have missed or left out on open and closed principle? So the next one is Liskov substitution. And um, this principle says that when I have a child class, um, it should be substitutable for the parent class without breaking something. So uh, whenever I would normally use the parent class in my app, I should still be able to use the child class without breaking the, the flow or without causing an error. Um, so I, I know you'll get sick of, of seeing shapes, but it's just easy to understand. So here's shapes again. Um, the really frustrating thing about this example is everything is defined here like in the math mathematically correct way. Um, for example, a rectangle is indeed um, a shape wherein the height equals the width. And in fact, a square is a kind of a rectangle that where in the, or sorry, the, the height times the width gives you the area in the rectangle. And a square, the height does equal the width, and it's a kind of rectangle. So everything is in fact correct, but what's the problem? Um, you can see that the, the square came first and then came the rectangle. So likely when you first designed the user flow, it was one where you could set the height or the width independently without changing the other one. Uh, but then when the square comes along um, and the user wants to use that same flow and changes the height, then automatically the width would be changed as well. And that's something probably the flow was not originally used to do, uh, set up to do. So it would cause maybe the user some unexpected behavior. Um, so I know that this is uh, kind of a trivial and tedious example and probably Hopefully none of you have to code about rectangles and squares all day and stuff. So why should we talk about this in a, a Ruby context? Um, so I think there are some things that make this actually particularly challenging in, in Ruby. Um, one of them is that you have um, optional parameters that a method might take. And I, for me, this makes this, this um, particular challenge quite, uh, this particular um, principle quite tough in Ruby. Because you ne it can be not so obvious whether the when you have optional parameters in the child or in the parent, whether one is substitutable for the other in every single situation. And the same is, is true when, um, when you acknowledge that it's not always super clear what type of uh, parameter is going to be passed into a method, the parent or the child, as well as return from the parent or the child. So the compiler is not going to do that checking for you. You have to do it. And the fact that there's no really, formally speaking, abstract classes or interfaces in, in Ruby. Like, um, did any of your, your moms ever have like that special, um, special silverware and plates and stuff that you never could really use because it was for like the special guests when they would come? Um, 
like so in like the code base that I work on now, there's actually some classes that we never in Ruby that we never actually use in practice, but rather they're just like templates that because there's no really formally speaking abstract classes. Um, so only the children of those classes are meant to be used in practice, but it's just not so obvious to the person who's first looking at that part of the code base. So I found these things quite confusing in Ruby when trying to work within this principle of the fact that a kid should always be able to be substituted for the parent. So the thing that helped me to visualize how to do this is this slogan, um, which is told from the perspective of the child. That's require no more than the parent and promise no less than the parent. So require no more in terms of what's being passed in and promise no less in terms of what you're doing um, for the, the, what are you returning, or what you're kind of stuff you're performing. Um, so anything I might have left out about this from JavaScript perspective or Ruby perspective. Okay, next part of the competition. May I use this drawing? Uh, can I use the first one? So um, from this side of the room, who is a very nice um, drawer? So Gui already showcased his skills, so he's done with his part. Um, can you help us? <laughs> I, I believe in you. <laughs> we did this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you're going to get a random, um, solid principle, and uh, you cannot, you cannot say anything. You cannot write any letters, but please give us a visual representation of what you think the principle is. So without writing letters or anything, can you kind of draw the picture in your mind of how... <laughs> and then we're all going to guess what is it. <laughs> Any ideas? Keep it with one And can you draw anything? Or you just want to... Principle. Oh, very good. Single responsibility principle. Okay, and one more. Who is your friend in the audience? Okay, this team is now in the lead. Okay, can you give us any clue, any hint? 
hardest stone in this world. Okay, hardest stone in this world. Uh, hardest substance. Cheese. Swiss cheese. Swiss cheese, okay. And what? Actually, I just drawing up. Okay, and Swiss cheese, what can you say about Swiss cheese? Tasty. Tasty, and what is it called? Falls. Falls. So when we think about falls, what can we think about? Which principle can we think about? Open and Open, close, and full. Okay, very good. Okay. I just have two cheese. Okay, that was the top one. Okay, both teams are now tied again. You want me to try the HDMI? Oh, I got it. HDMI, you can unplug the white one, that, that one. Oh, I think this, is, this is a HDMI, actually. You can plug the therapy. It's better that way. Okay, sorry for the technical challenges. Now on to the I in solid is interface segregation principle. So basically it's saying that I should not have to rely on either an interface or an API that I don't use. That's interface segregation. So 
Um, again, um, excuse the C-sharp code, but it's actually quite uh, constructive and illustrative. So, um, I have an interface here that says that's for a smart device. It says that I have to uh, implement all of these methods before I have a smart device. And that makes a lot of sense when I'm setting up my smart printer here. Uh, but then what about my just basic printer? Um, it's not a very good interface anymore for me. So um, it's kind of uh, breaking the interface segregation principle because now I have to know about and implement these methods when I'm not even using them anymore. So, uh, but we don't have to worry about this one because in Ruby there's no interfaces, right? Wrong. Well, I, it is right, but I would suggest to you that there's actually kind of an analogous thing that can be going on in Ruby. Um, this might be a bit small to see. Um, may I? Yeah. Uh, yes. Another one? Yeah. Do it all. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit dark and <laughs> spooky, but is it okay? Um, yes. So, uh, this is all cool on the left hand side. I have a calculator that is used in this show uh, action, and it's all well and good. But now I have the calculator and I want to use it in two different actions, a show and a create. Um, and only in the create do I want it to persist to the record, so it saves it to the database and the create method. Uh, but in the show method, I do not want it to persist to the method because it's only a show. I just want it to return the result. So now um, I have to do some checking whether in the calculator, whether I'm going to save the result of the calculation or not. So what do I have to do? I have to do this cute thing where I pass it this parameter on the end to tell it whether to save or not. So now in this show method, I have to know about uh, the, the saving logic, even though I'm not using it anymore. So in Ruby, I'm also still breaking interface segregation principle. Um, so interface segregation principle, I think, still can be a problem in Ruby. So. Uh, the last one, D in solid, is dependency inversion principle. So it says that I, in my apps and my uh, in my code, I should depend on abstractions rather than implementation level details. So as much as is possible, um, build my stuff around abstractions and um, don't have to know about the inner workings of, of uh, other parts of my code. Um, so before I move on, do did everyone? Know who are, are Rufus and Gallant? <laughs> I'm so kind of worried it was only a US thing. In, um, in primary school, we had these weird comics with these kids, Goofus and Gallant. And Goofus, as you may guess from his name, he was the bad kid that you were not supposed to be. And Gallant was the, the good kid. So it's a bit strange to remember, but we had these, these kids. Um, so from perspective of uh, interface, from perspective of dependency inversion principle, do you think it was Goofus who who wrote this one, or was it Gallant who wrote this one? So is this a good example from dependency inversion or a bad example? Bad example. I would agree. Um, what do you think you might change about this one? There are multiple things, but does anything jump out at you? It's not organized. It's not organized. I, I agree. Um, anything else in your mind? I can share with you that what comes to my mind, uh, especially with respect to this principle, is the kind of report that it's all generating is just hard coded in there and it's tied um, only to this report generator, which is something of an um, implementation detail. Whereas the one that Gallant coded is the same, but um, it's tied to this abstraction, so it doesn't have to know what the report format is going to be. It does a kind of dependency injection and it says that I can work with any kind of report as long as it you know, responds to this generator. Um, so Gallant did the better job in terms of dependency um, inversion principle. So um, do I do acknowledge, though, that if we make everything super abstract, it's going to be hard to figure out what it's even doing. So there are trade-offs to be made. 
So when do we make something more abstract? Um, I think it goes back to the other principles. It's um, it goes back to the people that the app is trying to serve, and we have usually some sense of what's going, what's likely to change in the code that we're doing, and I would program defensively around those those parts of the code. Okay, last challenge, the thing that you've all been waiting for, um, to see who's really the most solid team. Um, you're going to get a piece of horrible code, and you have to tell me what's the horrible part about it, which, um, which principle is it breaking, and how would you kind of fix it. So each team will get one horrible part of code. Hey, are you ready for your horrible code? Yeah. Horrible code number one. Yeah. Okay, so each team work together. Can you let me know what might be wrong with this part with this bit of code? I sound like I might hear have, I might hear an answer from the first team. Team number one, can you share with us what you did? Okay, cool. So what I'm hearing is that uh, so what part should be separate? This for the body starts to see the things you can be separate because this is completely abstract thing to more. And then we have a really specific uh thing like start something but but it's <laughs> yeah. That's why those inner stuff should be like separate. Cool, so I'm hearing from team one that the uh, the specific stuff should be separate class, is it right? Um, and that's something like what I had in mind as well. So um, what the example's author suggested was that, in fact, um, the format could be passed in separately, and it need not be part of um, uh, something that's hard-coded. And there could be stuff that can be separated out as well. So OK, thank you for both teams. Okay, so in reflecting on all those principles, as I um, put this all together, I was kind of starting to ask myself, what makes this all so difficult in Ruby? Um, does it really need to all be so difficult? Is there something kind of uh, historically that makes it hard for each and every Ruby project to align with these principles? And um, does anyone know this story about the snake and the apple? Like, why, like, it's symbolic that um, you know it's difficult moving. That there's um, something that makes it hard for us to do the right thing every day. Something in the past, um, and there's a similar story about Ruby. Um, or sorry, there's a similar story about Rails. Um, so some would argue that when we're using Active Record, actually we're setting ourselves up for actually making it difficult to follow all these principles. And if you look at the um, Ruby guides themselves or the Ruby docs, they say that the um, M in MVC is tied to active record, which is responsible, and active record models are uh, responsible both for data, uh, you know, persistence in the database, and business logic, two things um, in a model. So you can see that here. Um, application record or, or active record base, when we're, when we're inheriting from that, we're getting all the stuff that allows us to do CRUD actions on a, on a record in the database. So all those methods. And all of this stuff is about um, persistence in the database as well and queries. So one responsibility in a model is
is definitely the database stuff, mapping to a database. And then another you can see here is all about business logic. And we have something like this usually, I think, in most of our models, unless they're super, super simple. So um, this is something that in almost all our, as soon as we generate a resource in Rails, like already we might be setting ourselves up for making it hard to follow a solid. So what are the things that, that we can do about this? Um, there are three things maybe we can do. Um, one, about it, one of the things is separating out the business logic into its own class, just a plain normal class, not backed by active record. Another is there are alternatives to active record, um, not suggesting that we should or should not use them, but they're out there. And the last is to think in terms of object, objects rather than just um, necessarily, just uh, straightforwardly thinking that a model maps to the table in the database and that's it. So if I have an employee table, um, maybe I also have a intern class and a, a supervisor class and a mid-level manager class. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a one-to-one -one mapping from uh, kind of uh, model to uh, database table. Um, so finally, what we can do in the real world is we don't have to memorize where all these principles are, but just keep in mind when we're reviewing code and um, generating a new resource in Rails or setting up a new class in JavaScript that um, kind of the ideas we talked about. So which team is the most um, the most solid? It was the front, the uh, final winner was the front half of the room team. And what would you get? It's a special candy only available in the US. I think so. I think. So any um, things I might have missed or any comments or questions about solid stuff, anything from JavaScript that anyone can share, any other perspectives before moving on? OK, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, we can raise some questions if you want to know more. And give a long blast to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll be presenting on <coughs> Foster Tech Community. So this is the slides I shared in uh, RubyConf last year in KL. Um, so let's get to it. So um, I'm Gui, I'm co-organizer of Ruby Meetup, um, co-founder of PicoNex, a fintech company, a volunteer in Penang Tech MY, um, runs a free class in the Sabrang Prai area, not on the island. Um, software developer at Functionize, we do AI testing platform. Um, Co-founder of Rayan Coding Academy, we teach school children how to code. Um, and let's get started. So minus one. So this one term is very popular in uh, Ruby community. Our beloved Max is nice, so we are nice. Uh, Ruby communities around the world are showing the same trend with um, community events like this, uh, workshops, and support groups. Um, so, 
Ruby Malaysia is nice. Um, after I graduated from US, so I started work in the PG area on app. That's my previous company. Um, that time I eager to explore what's available in the area related to tech. Like um, a lot of us here, we want to explore what's available here in Penang in terms of tech. So I found Ruby KL Brigade, which is based in KL, um, recommended by my colleague. So I went to my first meetup and I'm uh, in Mind Valley. If you heard about Mind Valley, it's a company in KL. Um, so I met Jimmy. So he started the um, Ruby meetup in KL after he went to Tokyo and then he saw a meetup there going on every month. So he started one here. Um, so I'm really happy to see that's a healthy tech community um, locally in Malaysia and in KL. Um, so I've been to most of the meetups. There's a lot of meetups in KL like Python, JavaScript, Golang, Rust. I know all of the organizers. So um, these meetups help to fuel my interest um, towards Ruby and provide in, um, interesting working experience. So um, today I want to share three main pillars um, to foster tech communities. So after involving the tech community since my university years uh, until today, um, I found that there are three secrets that link things to sustainable tech communities, um, namely join, volunteer, um, and teach, start and persist. So um, let's start with joining. Um, joining is the easiest that you can do um, for the community. So is it that easy? Um, depends. Um, everyone comes from different walks of life, um, various commitment um, throughout the year. So you have works, schools, you have other things after work. So um, therefore, a person needs to free up times and also travel to the event like here. If you are from Bayan Lepas, you need to jam all the way here. If you have other parts, like maybe Kada, you want to come here, you also need to have travel commitments to be here. Um, this arrangement can be barrier for some people in the area. Um, so let's talk about the organizer. So the, the organizer is the one who starts the dance, trying to create a supportive um, community. Even with uh, event without people, it's like dancing, dancing solo, right? this guy. Sooner or later, the guy will get burned out because you keep on dancing for a whole year or a few hours, like nothing gonna happen. So join the movement, be a supporter, join the events that you feel worth supporting, any events, right? The organizer will feel appreciated by the amount of the attendance. The more people attendance, the more support you get. It's getting merrier and merrier. So the organizer will feel very passionate to continue the journey to have more and more good meetups or good events, workshops, etc. So the group will grow larger and will be, um, be a healthy, supportive community. So what's the benefit for me to join? Like why, why, right? First, you gain knowledge from all the meetups you attend. Some you don't have chance to uh, came across. Some of the knowledge can help your project, even though you are not using Ruby, like just now solid if you are on other backgrounds, um, other programming language, it will help you to, the principle is the same across all language. And help you to um, learn new and creative way of solving problems. Um, I remember there's a topic about code smells in KL, um, meta programming and also structuring code with OOP. Um, this can help you to become a better programmer. Uh, furthermore, you gain multidisciplinary knowledge when the speaker are from different fields like fashion or banking. In here, we previously we have um, law tech, so people from the legal side coming in talk about like what's there in terms of legal, in terms of health. There's a lot of ways that you can incorporate tech into other fields that you see, can see opportunity, right? Um, so real world experience um, during meetups, a lot of participants are from workforce. They have valuable experience to share with you. Um, knowledge like engineering process. Uh, architect design um, can help you in work and improve your work quality. There are also presentations from fellow developers, share some solution towards the problem they face at work. We have uh, previously we have two developers here um, sharing JavaScript um, experience. One is React, so he will go through the whole React process, like why you should do this, why you shouldn't be doing this, how to start a boilerplate, all this stuff step by step. 
right? Those experiences are real and can possibly help people with similar issues. Also benefit for students um, because it gives them the industry insight of the real world scenario. So very good to have students here. We have real work, like just now share real work stuff. And if you come more, you will learn more about like different people from different companies that are doing different stuff. So um, grow your connections. So when you join a meetup, you are part of a passionate crowd with similar interests. Um, you have a chance meeting your future co-founders, colleagues, or partners in projects. Um, when you have similar topics and interests, you'll be more efficient in solving your problem and pursuing your dream. You can also make friends during events. For someone like me, um, I'm from Penang, so when I go to KL, um, it's very comforting to find uh, friends in the same interests, the same um, passion. So um, other than supporting um, on software related matters, you can also seek help from ser other services for your daily routines. Like maybe you want to rent a house, rent a room, or where to eat, where to get some things, um, where to buy stuff. You can all get the same information from the same group of people like here, right? So um, in the greater Klang Bay area, you find a lot of tech related meetups. So here are the lists if you are nearby, um, maybe you can check that out. We have Ruby, Golang, uh, Python, JavaScript, Blockchain, um, Agile, and Rust. All those are very good. Can they host it every month? You can go and check it out. Do they have a meetup page? Not necessarily a meetup page. They use different tools to do stuff, but they all have Facebook group. Yeah, you can check those out. Um, for uh, so if you already joined a lot of events like what's for me you've been to a lot of tech events like you want might want to consider further involvement in tech communities like what can you do next so now you can take an active role to support existing community by helping out like volunteering you can co-host the local events or arranging logistics for the events like uh, this can build up your skill in managing Projects work with people in the team, um, can build your self-confidence while helping the local community to grow, which is a win-win situation. Right? And while you are teaching, you are reinforcing what you already know. Uh, you also find multiple ways of using the knowledge. So you learn something. When you teach, you are facing different um, types of crowds. So you need to explain it differently. So that will reinforce like what you already know, and in the same way, it will open up different implementation on the same um, technique. So um, here are the lists that I know of that you can get involved. Real Skills, they have two to three workshops per year in KL, Penang, and Kuching. Um, tech Ladies, they have one to two workshops per year in Malaysia. They're based in Singapore. I know the founder. Um, she comes to Penang quite often. Um, Women Who Code is very heavy in uh, influence in KL. They host a lot of coding workshops for women. You can go and help out. Hi Ladies, um, a new community didn't really took off, but still um, there. You can also approach university association to um, educate students. So I've been to UM give a talk to students on how to do unit testing and also how to do uh, function functional testing using Cucumber. So you can approach university um, counselor. They will very glad to have you in university to give them some information about real world life and also things that's out of their coursework because they need those when they go out to work and it also help students to know what possible in terms of career. Like for me, I'm doing remote work. So for students, they might not know this is an option. You need to let them know there's a lot of possibility in multiple fields so that they can actually go and learn more rather than stuck with the things that they learn in school. Okay, you can only go to here. You're limited to this. So you help them to explore more what is possible um, in terms of future so that when they come out, you'll get a very 
good batch of hires or colleagues. Right? So um, after all this volunteering and supporting existing community, you feel that more people should have this support group and there is lack of support in certain fields. So now you are ready to take the lead to grow community in other regions, like here in Penang, right? So you can go for other regions like Perak or um, Kedah or other countries. Like I know um, efforts is going to East Malaysia. So like Sarawak and Sabah, there's people flying over there every week to do coding boot camps. It's crazy, but people do it. That's their passion. That's their effort to ensure their home, um, I would say, their birthplace and the community that know to help them to grow better. So start and persist. Community normally concentrated in places where a lot of people sharing the same interests. The coverage doesn't include a lot of places. For example, Penang. You know a lot of tech stuff is in island, right? If you go to another site, there's very few people got exposure on this. It's not they don't want it, there's no exposure. Yeah. So um, after volunteer and working with existing community, you will get experience to and skill to kickstart community that you wanted. But after you volunteer, you know all the logistics, how to get started, what is the things needed, what is the crowd, and what is the knowledge that you need to actually go to start to cover new territories that you can help people to grow. Your action will help to grow uh, local talents and boost local tech um, literacy. So how, how to get started? Um, so first is meet up. The most effective way of getting people in the same interest and start a community in the gra uh, grassroots level. So once you started, you need to be consistent. This is the keyword, consistent. And ensure that the meetup is conducted consistently. This sets up a brand. This, and this helps to reach out more people in the long run. So people know that you will be there every month or every week or every specific time and very particular group of people so that you, you build a mindset to the place so people know that this is the place I will be going if I want to do, go for a meetup, I want to meet people, I want to network, or I want to learn something. So you need to be a long-term commitment, not just, okay, one day, two day, okay, I don't want to do. You need to be persistent. Sec second one is bookshop. So um, this is essential to help people to be up to date in technical knowledge um, while spurring interest among people. Workshop serves as a strong magnet uh, where people see potential of knowledge learned from the event. The participant will gain interest in the language and framework where they involve hands-on workshop. So hands-on workshop, they actually do it, stick to their mind so they remember share experience this is more conversational way uh, reach, reaching out to people the event will relate to tech industry um, local contacts and spark in depth conversation that will help them to do their work better so you will have sharing session like in penang you have some engineers coming in sharing that his experience working in penang is will be different than you're working in kl so those experience very localized you can um, very uh, close conversation so that people will understand better, right? Um, last thing is to use tech tools to non-tech industry. Um, so tech is meant to improve work of people. Therefore, you can recommend tools that are relevant to local community, help people to do their work uh, more efficiently and improve tech um, literacy locally, like teachers, they are still using papers. We know that there are more efficient way of doing things, but they don't have that access or they don't have the knowledge of it. We can teach them how to use that. You improve their life, but they also will help you improve other stuff, right? So it's a two way. Help them, they help you. So bring tech to the non-tech um, industry is one of the good stuff, right? So um, you are making a difference. So 
that's the impact when you start a tech community. Um, you are creating new talents, you are creating opportunity and jobs, um, you're improving the digital economy, uh, you're providing support to fellow developers. So you are, if you are developers, you are not alone. You have a lot of people here. You can support each other. So if you gather together, you know, okay, I know you, and then you are doing this thing. When I have trouble, I can find you, and vice versa, right? Um, so not all community are created equal, though. Um, so an event or community is not a one-man show. It requires a team of people to manage and run it. Remember that uh, we are all equal. Um, no one owns the community, neither the first organizer. Right. It's run by the community for the community. So your effort in volunteer helps to inspire more people to join and generate more passionate developers. Uh, despite, despite all the hype, you need to understand that not all communities are created equal. Uh, people in your place might have different interests, cultures, language, experiences. So you need to understand those differences and provide contact, content that confronts the local uh, context. So um, I just some experience, tech community is not 100% success. In reality, tech community fails a lot, just like startups. You need to have strong um, courage and patience to endure all the failures that come to you. Uh, these are all some of the examples that I face um, when I start Penang Tech in uh, mainland area, area. So low attendance rate, no show, negative combat, comments, no support. Because it's a new stuff, you're trying to cultivate people, don't expect attendance. When I start this meetup, we are like three people. All those three people are speakers. So speaker, listen to speaker, but we still go on. Because this is you need to continue this. It's not that for three people we shut it off. No, you need to set an uh, example to let people know that this will happen no matter what. We will be here no matter what, right? So, and it's behind those sweating effort. There's a bright and happy moments. So this is the first class we conduct in mainland. The attendance quite okay. We do some uh, Python data analysis. And then the first few meetups, I think the second one, this one. And then this one is in uh, another co-working space. And this one. So we also reach out to Bar Council. So Bar Council is the Lawyer Association of Malaysia. We cooperate with them. We teach them how to code. So lawyers learn how to code because they want to keep in, keep updated to the latest friend, right? Their lawsuit will come in technology world. They need to understand what is this. So they actually learn how to code and they earn lawyer points. So if you are lawyers, you need to earn certain points from attending their courses. This is part of their project now to learn coding. So these are the efforts that we're trying to go, right? So what's currently happening in Penang? So we have uh, Penang Tech, um, Ruby and JavaScript made up this one. Um, Ray and Cody and Academy, we are still planning. We launched one class for students. Forwarder Me is here by ACAT. They are launching um, courses for um, um, adults. So if you are working or you're just fresh grad, you can follow um, the courses in Forwarder Me. And inside your initiative means if you have anything that you want to start or you want to um, promote tech community here, please do. And you can easily find us in meetups. We will be all over the place if we are tech meetups, right? Because you can see the same faces, <laughs> some of us. So in short, um, why local tech communities is, is important. We create more talents, then it will be creating more jobs, then you improve the local ecosystem, then the ecosystem will attract more good talents and company. So it's a full circle. First, we train the talents. So people will say, okay, here we have a lot of tech people. Company will be here hiring. Then companies here improve the whole ecosystem. Ecosystem good, then you will be more talents and more company. It's a 
whole cycle again. It's like in KL. So why talents are going to KL, not in Penang? Because that's no. If you compare the tech community scene in KL and Penang, there's a gap. We are still catching up, but it's, we are improving a lot in terms of previous year. So yeah, so do um, support or start um, tech communities in uh, Penang. So be a part of the local tech communities. Um, hopefully you found find this talk um, useful. And if you are um, keen to start one or wanted to start one or supporting one, please feel free to contact or um, come to the meetup next month. We'll be here also. Okay, thank you. So, any question on this? No question? No question, then we move to uh, the courses. Five tech tips. So, every meetup we have a session where anybody in the floor able to share tips that you um, work, right? Editor tips or any tips that can improve your work experience, any tips, command line or resources to get free stuff also can. No problem. Last time we shared about GitHub free account, free private account because it's just news, right? Any free tips or any tips, tech tips, any tips? Five. Do you have any? Hmm? Seven four 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 specific stuff or okay so for university students or you just start programming um this not this one that will flow so this is a very good resource that you can refer to set overflow you when you search google it will give you set overflow first few searches result they will give you this this is very good um Frankly, a lot of coding is coming from here. Copy and paste or modify a bit. Uh, okay, let me let me duplicate this one. Let me duplicate. Okay, this one. Set overflow. So for fresh grad or you wanted to start learning programming, this is a very good uh, place for you to do. What is JavaScript? Or what is Ruby? So another one is, what is Opal. So Opal is uh, a compiler from JavaScript, uh, from Ruby to JavaScript. So that's stuff. So you can right, see a lot of stuff. Here, if you start to learn programming, okay, that's one tip. So now, yeah. So the second tip for the new numbers to work in the industry, always try to save the whole software in a repository. So one of the famous things what we have in the source is called GitHub. Okay. So that's a place where you can store your code so that it doesn't reside on your local machine. Oh, you mean the UI? The one that you mentioned? Is it the GitHub yeah, it's UI? Easier to organize the codes. Okay. You don't have to save multiple files. 
Oh, okay, the version control. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So one thing is this one, the uh, Bitbucket, it's by Alassian. It's not the fastest, be frank, but it's free. You have unlimited repository. Okay. Um, another one. Yep. Yeah, just uh, one service that I'm using every day. Uh, other some people who is like note taking banks, like who is like, for example, uh, everyone. Other some? Okay, so uh, maybe how different? How year ago there is one service started, like medium size startup Notion SO. Notion. S-O S-O Dot S-O Okay oh. This is an amazing The amazing tool to store your notion This is an amazing tool to like uh, make your knowledge base This is an amazing tool even uh, to some kind of uh, to do this stuff make, managing your time even there's a calendar view a lot, so a lot of things that uh, you can store like a note or a save information to use that later. This is an example that I can propose. Good stuff. It's good stuff. So it links. Can you also sync with the mobile phone? Can you sync with the mobile phone? Can you sync with the mobile phone? Yeah. So Notion is an app. Right, I see iOS and Android. This, uh, yeah, I will, uh, well, application, desktop application, for example, it is because but it is based on uh, Electron. Oh, Electron. You need to pay, right? Uh, actually, mm, free uh, plan is like limited on 10,000 blocks. Mm. When you run something, it's like a block. Uh, and for USD per month, Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, this is nice, quite nice tool for collaborative work. So you can connect uh, mm -hmm. people in one uh, workspace and do all the stuff together with notifications and so on. Oh, collaboration also. Oh, nice. This is good. Good stuff. Notion. I remember that. Uh, do I. Uh, I remember. Let me check myself. It's my. Hold on. I don't know where. Never mind. There's a quick notes. Uh, is it this one? Yeah, this one. So um, I found out this one recently. Um, it's good. It actually is something like a gist. Um, you can host it by yourself. It also do highlighting, text highlighting, and everything. Um, it's built with Electron. Let me go to where's the. It's open source. You can fork it down, use it. Uh, where is the? There's a demo though. Okay, where's the demo? I think it's this one. It's just JavaScript. So. Uh, can I open maybe a bit? Yes, I find it interesting because it can embed the whole editor in the browser. So you can it also checks your error if you type something wrong. It do auto completes and do error checking in the browser itself. So if you wanted to build some sort of pro product with this, you can fork it and see their source code and see how they do it. Um, they, are, they use some library to do uh, syntax checking. I think the implementation, uh, the use case is straightforward. Just that uh, it's interesting that the implementation able to do highlighting and also uh, code checking. That's the code check.
yeah, somewhere you need to check out. So that's one tool that you can check out. Self-host, open source. Yeah. Let's see. Any more tips? Any more tips? Any more? Paste bin. Okay. Bin.org. Is it .com or org? .com? Oh, paste bin. So paste bin, if you want to send some snippet to someone, yeah. Temporarily, this is good. This is good too. So I think we have five. Yeah, we have five. Good. Tick tips is done. So speaker for next meetup. Who wants to volunteer for next meetup? I found this flow very interesting. I learned from the Python meetup actually. Previously, I don't schedule meetup for next one. I learned from Python meetup where they schedule the next meetup, this meetup. So it's good to reserve some speaker first. So you learn from other meetups by going to their meetups. Right. Anyone want to share a topic is on March? Let's see, March the second Tuesday. Second Tuesday will be 12th of March. Uh, Albert was interested in speaking about the group. I think we'll have to get back. Yeah, okay. Uh, on JavaScript? Yeah, JavaScript. JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. Then we can discuss more on that. So, I think he had okay. hoped he could speak today as well, but I think with this new kid, that maybe it's not so sure. Okay, we can confirm that afterwards. So, that Albert, anyone want to share? Such things that they will discuss on Slack chat with them currently on who can say what, for example, Python proposal, for example. Uh huh. So, uh -huh. they first about what can I show code, I uh -huh. need to know their uh, input requests. Example, they okay. need to know about something, and mm -hmm. I can say, Oh, I have experience about it, and I can share some. So that's why some things better to discuss in Slack chat if Slack chat. everybody can have access. Okay, okay. So uh, maybe I will find a few. Yeah, to, to, to set up that. Okay. So uh, we can I do that. Speak about something that was the kind of Mm hmm. Okay, so we have two, three JavaScript, right? Three JavaScript track. Any Ruby? No Ruby, then I will take up the Ruby track. Because normally I will prepare one talk. No matter what talk, I will just come up with one every month. So I make sure it happens. So um, how about any outside of JavaScript? Because we I introduced one new track called whatever track. Means you can do whatever you want. Growth hack. Uh, presentation stuff or soft skill we call it because we someone mentioned about it why everything about tech people want to hear outside of tech also so I introduced one track but only one slot not multiple slot because we still a tech meeting meet up so only one slot for the whatever talk so we might have speaker from other industry also from the fintech or law or whatever we try to get people from there to get different perspective right so we still have one slot for whatever track right so we have three good shout outs announcement hiring anyone the company is trying to celebrate their sixth year. So this year's theme is that uh, during the local meetup, they invite some members, different members, share their Docker experience, what they have been working on Docker. So it can be just like a talk, 15 minutes max, mm -hmm. uh, sharing your Docker experience, what you have been, if you are working in Docker, how you have been using it and your experience. So if someone is interested, uh, is to let me know, I will publish it by tomorrow or something. So all the speakers who come up get a t-shirt and a momentum from Docker and stuff. Sounds good. Good stuff. 
So um, if you have any questions later, you can talk to Kim. Um, any more shoutouts? Hiring? Any hirings? Hirings. Yeah, hirings. Well, if uh, there's uh, guys, maybe uh, our small company is maybe yeah, one or two junior developers, mostly web developers. Okay. Um, the first. Okay. You have the website. Oh. Just later I'll be posting up to okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, uh, if uh, any guys have any questions, web developer must be using JavaScript. Yeah, welcome. We can interview and process this. Okay. Nice. Good stuff. We have hiring call. Anyone? JavaScript people or Ruby or Golang. Okay. Or Golang? You want to put Golang? Okay. Okay. Any more? Yep. You want to. Oh, okay. I want to put. I'm sure. Yeah, you can talk. I just right. try to yep. copy it. Okay. Um, React Frontend. React Frontend. Okay. I will add it in. Any more? Good. Good. Okay. So, um, Docker Meetup will happen on March if you want to speak. Um, Surat, Sujay. So, we talk to Sujay. Sujay later, right? And then. Uh, Junior web developers, um, Ninda Tech, Senior Bahad, Victor Chai is hiring uh, JavaScript, Ruby Golang, um, Nerlis, Senior Bahad, React, R O, Nerlis, okay, Senior Bahad, um, React Funnel. So I will be posting all this to the group, uh, JavaScript group, and also Ruby group, and also the React group. So let's see what's next. Doesn't refresh. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, see you in the next meetup. Thank you. Okay. So there is pizza outside. If you want to pay, please pay. If not, I have no idea. What